teacher input, all that part of their evaluation, they're accountable all the way down to the line where teachers and parents and students are accountable as well. 5% of our teacher evaluation instrument is input from students. Yes. Students. And, you might say, and I'm K-12. You might say, how can a kindergartner give input on their teacher? All right? It's pretty consistent. The, the data doesn't really lie. It tells us the truth, right? And we can deny it, but you're still going to have to deal with it, right? That's so important. So, these relationships help us build that bridge for employee evaluation. I talked about escalating academic success. Uh, over the past four years, I'll give you a handout that really digested in, in a variety of ways. We've seen graduation rate increase, dropout rate increase, increase in reading performance, increase slightly in math performance, which is always our Achilles heel. Our science scores are up. Um, our, uh, our retention rate has dropped at third grade. And we really believe it's because of this transparent accountability that we've instituted and all focusing on students. It really is very, very, very complimentary. Okay? When we talk about major goals, wow, there's so many in education. Remember, we're in Florida. It's going to change tonight, right? Uh, State Board adopted the uh, digital education plan, which I read, and I thought, oh, that's nice. Okay, all right. That's $260 million worth of expectations, and they got 37 cents to spend, so I don't know what that's going to look like, right? But employee evaluation was something we had to focus on because we saw it coming. We put together an administrative evaluation tool that included those employee engagement surveys, support card surveys, before we did the teacher evaluation uh, instrument, and the board adopted it and moved forward. We worked on it under a year, and our administrators were scratching their head. So when it came time for us to put into play the teacher evaluation instrument, I looked at my union president and I said, wait, this is not going to be a problem. Is it because we're already doing it on the admin side? She says, no, it's not. Now, that conversation will not have taken place three years ago, four years ago, because of the relationship issue. You understand how valuable that is. Um, it's about relationship building. So I, and I, when you talk about what matters, these two right here, absolutes. They are non-negotiables in Saturn's camp. You can call it rounding, you can call it visiting, you can call it whatever you want to, all right? But I have the expectation that my four assistant superintendents, attendants round on their staff and they report to me when they ran. I had the expectation that a teacher, pardon me, that a principal, let me just walk through. Assistant superintendents round on directors, directors round on principals, principals round on teachers, and teachers round on kids, all right? And we all have expectations to our customer, the parent. And that really is our focus, that's how we, how we walk through it. We develop stop by reports, we develop all those things, that but the most important thing is this rounding, and it really does matter. Why? I go back because it was all about relationships for us and accountability and transparency, and it worked. Suddenly, we talked to each other. <clears throat> Suddenly, we began to have discussions that were professional. Suddenly, we began to have an excited, factually, data-based discussion that was uh, useful rather than yelling and screaming at each other. You understand? In a professional way, right? In a professional way. Like, really, really was a professional. Now, Robin mentioned leadership development institutes. They are the lifeblood, I believe, of, of our success. When you force some people to sit and develop themselves who really don't want to be there, two things happen. One, they change, or two, they leave. Right? About 8% of them left. They did, and that's okay. It really was not a bad thing for either one of us. It was just that thing that happened when we looked at each other and said, Superintendent Ross, I can't do that. I can't. I've led through power all my life. Authority is challenging to me, if you understand, if you understand what I'm talking about, okay? There's a difference between those two things. And so we had some lead, we had some retirement, that's okay, all right? The beauty of this is that we've actually had the same type of conversation in our leadership development institutes that we have with our principals with board members, district staff, we're all in this together. We all really are, and it really does make a difference in all centers on that relationship idea, all right? So, why, uh, and I've mentioned some of these already, but how did it make us grow as a school district and become 
better than we were. We centered on that 50% performance and 50% on professional attitude. Both of these are vital. I absolutely believe, and this is where I get a little, little sideways with all, all those data people who say to you and me, it's all about data. It is. It is, without a doubt. Okay? But if you're not interpreting data in a relationship model that's useful and pertinent and you're not focusing on those relationships of why that data is important, it really becomes just data. Right? And you're not going to use it in any strange way. All right? <coughs> so, it redefines excellence for all employees. Here's what we see in Santa Rosa County. We were number two. You know, number one would have been great. We're excited to be in the top ten. We really are. I mean, in the changing world we live in, that's really important. But our goal is excellence above where we are, is to be better than we are. And why would a high-performing school district begin to restructure themselves, to make themselves do some things that are painful? It's so that we can build a ladder a continuity of success to the next level. We know we can be better. And once you recognize that fact, it becomes easy to implement some things that would change. I'll also share this with you. What redefines <coughs> excellence for all employees is a huge paradigm shift in Santa Rosa County and in the state of Florida. High achieving, very few teachers. Am I right? Can I get an amen over here? <laughs> High achieving, is very few, very, very few. When I measured myself this year with the parameters that I set up, I was average. And I looked at my board and said, you got an average superintendent of the rubric we've developed. Why? Because I'll guarantee you, if we invoke Marshall or Danielson or whatever it is that you are playing with with Race to the Top, you're gonna find yourself the same as we are. Your teachers are quality teachers, but as in Santa Rosa County, 94.6% of them were highly effective. I don't think so. I don't think so. The superintendent wasn't. And so when I stood in front of my board, they looked at me and said, you're average? Yes, I'm average. But I'm going to get better. And here's how I'm going to get better. It set the tone for my administrators and my teachers. All the way down to that Ed Sport bus driver who looked at them and says, I can probably be better too. I can. And that's the climate all invoked by a relationship building mechanism. So accountability and employee excellence really stems from having the vision of invoking or implementing a system such as evidence-based leadership that really holds yourself accountable. It's really about holding me accountable before I hold others accountable. She mentioned servant leadership. We read the, reading books, doing a book study, and which is fantastic, it's awesome. Uh, you can, there's a hundred out there that you can choose from, but our focus, as I go back to, well, the three non-negotiables are we're servant leaders, okay? We demand excellence of ourselves and others, and we focus on kids. That's the reason we're going to move forward, and that's the reason that I believe we are a high-performing school district that will be better in the end. I know I've covered a lot at a very rapid pace, but I would love to entertain some questions that you may have. Silence falls across the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Define, define servant leadership because I mean, I'm sure they ask you that. You're a servant leader. Define it. Servant leader is that my focus is not on myself, first of all, is that I focus on that person or persons that I'm responsible for. And in education, it really is about kids. So that really is why we're not negotiating about focusing on students. You got something to add? The only thing I was going to say uh, in Tim's description, it was kind of hard if you didn't live what Tim lived with that. Uh, constitutional amendment issue, it completely polarized people. And it was all about beliefs and values. And so it was a very, very tense and emotionally charged time. So when he says this was hard, it was hard. Because it was on national news, it obviously was on local news, uh, you can go to the website and still all of the articles pop up. So what Tim did, uh, and we say this with absolute honesty, he took a risk at a time when most people would not have stepped out there. And, but because he did, and he talks about the union president, Rhonda, and literally they created a evaluation in as smooth a process as I think would even ever be possible. Of course they had a great leader, not only Tim Rosdick, but Lewis Lynn. 
who is their assistant superintendent for HR is the one who led that, that particular charge and did a great job. He did. It was tumultuous in and of itself. The First Amendment issues that we dealt with polarized every individual in the center of the county. Everyone. I, I, I could just start by telling you there were three separate cases to that whole litigation issue. They're all resolved. We were a better school district because of it. I believe so. Um, it was tough hard, very, very hard to deal with. Uh, I had to make some decisions, the board had to make some decisions that, I'm just going to give you a few, because then I'm going to follow up and shut up. But I'm going to challenge I don't, I don't believe in speaking. You want to go leave a challenge and hear it. I teach a Sunday school class at Manual Baptist Church. The parent of one of the daughters in that litigation that I had to disallow to speak at a high school graduation because she was senior class president as one of my one of my parents and one of my students. We talk about relationships being close. I mentioned the principal hired me, mentored me, tutored me. I had to look at him and say, if you do that again, I'll fire you. It was hard, hard. You cannot believe how hard it was. Those relationships polarized everyone. And, and if we hadn't had a focus of following up and intervening, I, I really believe we would have dismantled as a school district. Uh, but we did and we did because of the fabric of the individuals realized in the end that the most important things we deal with every day are students, not ourselves. And so ultimately we put those things aside. I share that with you because I know you've got difficulties. <coughs> I know what an economic melee is. I know what a dysfunctional school district is. The one thing I don't have is a dysfunctional school board, but I could, all right, if, if we didn't work it, okay? And, and I share that with you because I know you got problems. I know you do. All of us do. We're just that way. And I know school systems are facing difficulties, but I doubt, I doubt that you had the difficulties we had in 2009 and 2000 to 2010, all right? And it's because quality, people do a quality thing and building those relationships that matter, okay? A little bit about us, there's a handout I'm going to pass out right up here. It's, it's, it's straight off of our who we are as our, our SACS accreditation. Gives you some more input about data and why we do what we do. Yeah, yeah, the one thing, you know, questions. we'll take questions. The one thing I can uh, say from, you know, um, if you remember at the beginning, we said that Robin and I have been doing this full time with school districts for two years. So, and we're honest about that when we start working with other school districts. We, are, we haven't been doing this forever. We, the student group's been implementing evidence-based <coughs> leadership for a little over a decade. But one of the things, our success depends on school district success. <coughs> That's the way we judge, you know. So, we have a limb too, by the way, <laughs> our student group. And our limb, you know what our goals are? Your goals. So if your parent satisfaction increases and your student achievement increases and your employee engagement increases, then our evaluation is <laughs> okay. So that's one part of the accountability piece. The other part that I think is that we didn't even have any idea when we moved into this realm of our professional lives is how much we would experience the relationships ourselves with what the districts go through. So, like when Tim's up here saying that, you know, we feel it. You know what I mean? So, I mean, and that's the part I think that we've learned more than anything is we're, that's why we really do value that partner process because it's really not about somebody having the answers. It's about us figuring out together and sitting down and talking through the things that can make somebody better. And in turn, if there's anything that we can do, just from that external eye, from a model standpoint, then that's what makes it. That's what that's what makes it for us. Let me editorialize that on a personal way. What she's saying, nice and kindly, is that that external opinion, that external eye, uh, has often looked at me and said, "Superintendent Rocket, him, you can do it that way. It's going to be bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's okay." Because I was looking for that, you understand? Because uh, here's, here's a quote for you from, from a wonderful leader, my dad, and others. He may have stolen from someone. The only difference between a grave and a rut is the depth. 
<laughs> so we're doing it the same way, right? Same way. And believe me, it's that okay. We could just keep doing it the same way. We'd have great success, but we wouldn't. I don't believe the excellence that we need. So their external opinion brings to the table something that I don't have. I don't get to visit other school districts the way they do. I don't get the data from 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 nationally. Uh, accredited people. I don't get the insight that they see a better way to do it doing things and bring it to me. It's just powerful. It really is. Right. Questions for me? Yeah. Yes. Sir. Do I understand that the law changed and required you to have an email system for teachers? Or did that happen outside the law? Would they have done it without the external pressure or what uh, would they have done it? without external pressure. In Florida, it's, 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 the, the paradigm of leadership at the state level is a little different, or maybe, maybe the same, I'm not sure. We have an elected governor. We have an appointed commissioner of education, which is overall K-20. We have an appointed by the governor, right? We have an appointed state board of education, which is appointed by the governor. We have an elected house and senate, all three, four, all four put forth an educational vision. So that's complicated. Okay, you're all right? You kind of don't know who to believe, all right? But what is interesting is that what took place was this bill called 736. Passed out of the House and out of the Senate. And suddenly we have a we have a performance pay bill which required an evaluation that measured teachers with 50% of of, uh, well, based on student performance. So would we have gotten there anyway? Probably because we had already started on the race to the top eval, right? And it was coming into play, but our legislatures, and I love them, but sometimes I really want to thump them in the head, right? I, I really want to say to them, wake up, okay? But the bottom line is they were going to do it anyway, right? So the culture was that we, we're going to create this. Now, I, I would not recommend your state leadership that you go back and do it the way we did it. And I'm not sure if it'll even actually survive, all right? And there's a lot of questions about that. But the climate was performance. And then your, your question is really centered upon, I think, centered upon the expectations of we're going to have a better product in the next quarter. And that's, that's why the impetus to a new teacher evaluation system. And, and the one thing I can, just to connect at some time, I would, Bill, I'd encourage you all to connect with Dan and uh, Jackson Public School in Michigan because Dan has implemented a teacher evaluation system in his school district in <coughs> with a no mandate. So I think that's worth the, um, worth the conversation at some point. Awesome. Mm -hmm. but, but with that realization that Dan's feeling is it's coming, yeah. so I right. want to step out there and do it before somebody tells me how to do it. So. Yeah. Oklahoma City Superintendent? Um, the great state of Oklahoma is, is very, very upset with the state of Florida. <laughs> we also have a Republican governor. We have a Republican state uh, superintendent of schools. And uh, well, what's happened is your A to F grading system, uh, we've been dealing with that now. Uh, we're in the process of that. The, the whole teacher and leader effectiveness issue is uh, reminiscent of what you guys lived through. And you would think that this country would understand after the kind of things you guys had to live through that we would do it better, but we aren't. And we did not learn anything watching what was going on in Florida. It, it's amazing. You guys have done a really good job of, with reform and all, and but. You, you did it at, at warp speed, and now we're trying to do the same thing. Yeah. It, it's well, crazy. That, that is so appropriate. I, I can tell you, uh, if we would reverse the state of Florida 9, 11, almost 11 years now as we began to build this system, we had no idea that it would end up in a performance based system, first of all. Uh, it, there's lots of dialogue we could have there. So if you're sitting in a school district or state which has yet to begin to build that bicycle, we have some suggestions for you about really how to do it right. Now, we educators say this, you may, may say, oh, no, Tim, that's not right. We are our own worst enemy. Right? Why the impetus for change? It's because what we were producing wasn't what was needed. Understand that. So as educators, we tend to become sedentary. You may not be this way. I don't know. 
But our state for years and years and years and years, we sat and we watched students fail. We watched students prepare for no jobs. And, and it was a very dysfunctional system. So that change is going to come, I think, a pleasure. And I think we've experienced the pain. And we have not found any pleasure in it. But, but you are dead on that. There's some things we did right in the state of Florida. And I take ownership for those. Although I didn't do it, all right? But um, there's some things that you could learn from it and not do. And it's okay. And I don't know how to cascade that up to a national level to say, it's okay it's, that we made mistakes, okay? It, it is okay that we didn't honor the profession the way it should be honored. And uh, a student is not a widget or a commodity in there. And that's why my part of my slide, it said 50% of it, of the teacher evaluation and a superintendent's evaluation and an administrator's evaluation is centered around student performance is important. But that other, there's 50% that, that is just as important that we've got to deal with. So balance that out. So, good luck. Right. <laughs> Call us if you need I've enjoyed the morning. Do you have any more questions or comments? Good. Anybody else? I have one. You yes. mentioned a book study. I'm sorry, I didn't get the book. The end, you're doing a book study it's a servant uh, leader, all right? Um, it, uh, it's pretty good. It's a good book, excellent book. Um, we're in our uh, second month of it. Uh, let me let me share with you uh, what I did. You know, we have a lot of accountability in everything we do, all right? Everything. So, in Florida, if it moves, we measure it. All right? <laughs> I want to my administrators, and I'm calling, when I'm saying my administrator core, from the director of maintenance, okay, to the director of transportation, which I don't have anymore, which I wish. I said, we're all reading this book. And by the way, I've got to advise you into groups, and we did, and, and I've developed them into groups, and here's the people you're going to talk to, and I don't care how you There is no accountability to this. I don't, I'm not going to find out if you read the book. I'm not. I'm not going to look, all right? All I'm going to do every month is send out an email, and I want you to come and think. Okay? Profound, profound change. Okay? Don't have to measure it. Don't have to do it. Not going to be held accountable. Send me the read for enjoyment and for professional knowledge. Wow, it was fun. I get an email almost every day. It's time to send out another email. The last one's read page 34. It says blah blah blah. What do you think? Power authority. Send me what you want. Okay? And it's, it's just the way we work it, but we backed up from the accountability side. I can highly recommend that. It was a blind, as we say in the South, a blind hog finds an apron every day. I'm going to try